Oh, yes. Can I sing? Oh. Are we? Okay. Um, thank you for joining us and welcome to our joint meeting with the City Council and the Planning and Zoning Commission. Thank you to our, our citizen planning and zoning commissioners for joining us and um, for everything you do. You are greatly appreciated, so I hope you know that. Yeah, well, I won't call you out yet, Ryan. <laughs> We, we waited for you. Okay, um, item number one is roll call attendance. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. For the Meridian City Council, Councilmember Milam is absent. Councilmember Burnt? Here. Councilmember Palmer is absent. Councilmember Little Roberts? Here. Councilmember Kavanagh? Here. Councilmember Borton? Here. And Mayor DeVeard? Here. The Planning and Zoning Commissioners, Commissioner Holland? Here. Commissioner Seal? Here. Commissioner McCarville? Commissioner Olson? Here. Commissioner Fitzgerald? Here. And Commissioner Casanelli is absent. Also, Commissioner Perot is absent. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Item two is adoption of the agenda. Madam Mayor. Mr. Borton. Do we adopt the agenda as published. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the agenda as published. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All ayes. Yes. Item three is our comprehensive plan update. We're so excited. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I know some of you have heard uh, some version of this uh, just recently even, but uh, bear with me um, and Brian as we give you an update on the comprehensive plan. But first, I just want to uh, thank you all for attending. We don't do this often enough, so I take I appreciate you taking the time, getting to know each other a little bit better. We do have some new newer planning and zoning commissioners, and so it was also an opportunity just to kind of bring them up to speed and, again, put um, some names to some faces and... and uh, time allowing well we've got to feed the planning and zoning commissioners because they have a meeting at six but maybe break some bread together too so again just appreciate you all taking the time um, hopefully this is going to be a productive uh, hour and a half to two hours so the headliner uh, for for this afternoon's meeting is the comp plan update my name is Caleb Hood uh, Brian McClure is actually the I don't know if he's the official project manager but he certainly is acting like the project manager and I do appreciate all the efforts he's put forth um, we do have a couple of the planning and zoning commissioners that are on a steering committee, so maybe I'll just start with that. There's, uh, I didn't count them before this meeting, but there's approximately 25 people that have been appointed to oversee this process from all walks of life and different backgrounds. Um, we meet once a month and kind of just oversee the process, the reviewing uh, deliverables and, and all that. We do have two of the Planning and Zoning Commissioners, Commissioner McCarville and Holland, are both on the steering committee. And then Councilman Burnt also represents the council kind of as an ex officio or a liaison uh, on that as well. So uh, those are meeting uh, meetings happening monthly. So we hired Logan Simpson uh, in May, June, um, and they've been coming alongside of us and helping do a lot of the technical writing and facilitating and organization and kind of keeping us on, on track and on schedule. Um, our main point of contact is actually leaving them, which is unfortunate in the middle of our project, um, but we're going to see this thing through to the end. Uh, they also have some uh, sub-consultants, and I'll touch on them in a little bit. So we're about halfway through the, the planned development, so we thought this was about a good time to touch base with everybody. So feel free, if you hear something that sounds weird or you need some further explanation, wave us, flag us down. This is meant to be a little more interactive, but if no one says anything, we have a slide deck that I'll run through and we'll be done. Um, there are a couple of things, though, where we do want to pause and give you uh, an intentional opportunity to provide some feedback. Uh, we have some questions just on, on kind of at a crossroads of where, where you think uh, we should go uh, as we continue on this process. So um, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time on this slide. Hopefully most all of you understand why we plan and what a comprehensive plan is. Um, but just at its, its heart, uh, the state does require all cities and counties in Idaho to to have a plan and implement that plan. That's the Local Land Use Planning Act of 1975. I will just note, uh, um, at least for now, that's a requirement. There is some legislation going through, uh, House Bill 127, uh, that is making it, potentially would make it optional for counties to plan, and uh, that certainly would impact uh, Ada County. Uh, I don't necessarily see that happening in Ada County if it were enacted, but uh, certainly as a state, um, there could be some far-reaching implications from that. But anyways, um, the Local Land Use Planning Act and how comprehensive plans, what they address and what they do certainly has evolved over the past 44 years. Um, but a lot of the, the elements that are required to be analyzed haven't. So property rights, population, 
health, safety, welfare, uh, those types of things are still ingrained in a comprehensive plan and need to be addressed. So to our plan specifically, uh, we're in phase three, uh, hashtag My Meridian Choices. Um, so th it's about opportunities and choice. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this. Um, at the end of phase two, which was right around September, we had a visioning document. You all had a copy or at least an opportunity to acquire a copy of that. You can still go to the project website and get that visioning document. But that was really what we heard in phase one and phase two. Um, we're building on that with phase three and it's a little more technical at this point, although we still are engaging with the public and Brian's gonna talk on, on that here in just a minute on what we're actually doing uh, with, with phase three. So again, in that visioning document, we came up with five value themes and then supporting visioning statements uh, beneath those. Again, I'm not gonna sit on this slide too terribly long knowing that you all have, are familiar with that to some degree. So as we entered into the contract and, and kind of talked about it with the mayor and council too, even as we were setting the budget, um, there's some specific things that we really wanted to focus in on. We know that the plan has some good elements today and some good policies today. Um, but there, but our community is changing enough where there was uh, a few areas where we definitely wanted to dig in deep and um, maybe not necessarily start from scratch, but really, really rethink uh, the baseline, the foundation for some of our policies. Um, one of them, or two of them, are really our public services and, and strategic growth management. So the first part of that, incentives and disincentives for, for development, kind of go goes hand in hand with even the second one. Um, where we're extending those services. We haven't developed uh, incentives or disincentives yet, and honestly, some of that may not even be in the comprehensive plan. They may be passively in the comprehensive plan. It may be uh, some of the visionary statements or objectives in the comprehensive plan, but that's in direct alignment with the city's uh, strategic plan as well. So uh, developing incentives and, and disincentives for the type of development we'd like to see and in the location we'd like to see is something we're definitely talking about as we uh, d further develop this comprehensive plan. Um, and then evaluating those growth impacts. We're, we're right in this right now with our consultants and developing a point system uh, that's looking at uh, all kinds of uh, infrastructure, everything from uh, the pathway network adjacency and if it exists to uh, police response times and fire department, you know, how far our fire department is and their response times and some of those levels of service that have been established. Um, how close you are to parks and, and those types of things. How close or far a water or sewer line is. And so there's a point system that we're developing that really is meant to help inform you all as you're looking at a new project to kind of say, it's not necessarily a scorecard, but you can kind of look at it that way. Is this close to those, is this the natural progression of the city limits or is this out there? Is this on the fringe and boy, it's tough for our fire department to respond in a timely manner and they're dragging the sewer line a mile and you know those types of things. So that's really kind of that, that Im growth impact tool uh, that we're developing. So a lot of the departments are involved with that and helping us figure out what those metrics are and the scoring system for that. Um, not quite ready to, to roll that out yet. We're still kind of developing some of that and, and how we're gonna manage that. Uh, but we're, we're, we're knee deep in that right now. Uh, transportation and economic development are two other focus areas. And for transportation, Logan Simpson has hired Kittleson and Associates, uh, their local uh, group here that, that are helping us really look at a master mobility map and develop that. And then also analyze some, some corridors that could uh, support transit or other modes of transportation in the future. And then looking at that in conjunction with the land uses that are adjacent or nearby uh, to those uh, corridors. And then economic development. So Leland uh, is another sub of, of uh, Logan Simpson, and they're looking at uh, economic development. We just got some information here earlier this week on some of the uh, market analysis and some target industries uh, that, that they recommend that the city kind of pursue, and even some locational uh, value uh, that some of those industries are looking for just with where Meridian's at being in the center of the valley and some ways to, um, to maximize that. I will just quickly st state uh, through, um, and Brian's going to talk a little bit about this, but um, Cameron actually facilitated the economic development uh, focus group. And again, Brian will talk a little bit more about that. But one of the things in a couple of the sessions that I sat in on um, that really came to light was transit. And uh, yes, we, we have pretty good location being central, but the only way to get to those jobs is to drive. 
you get a few people that bike and some that walk, but that's that's pretty limited. And so I heard that, and I wasn't in all the meetings, but that was an overarching theme was, boy, transit would be great to recruit employers, and we could expand our businesses. And so we're really exploring that even in advance of, of fully documenting that in this new plan. Um, we're ex exploring right now with Valley Regional Transit the first uh, fixed line route for Meridian. So more to come on that, particularly for the council in uh, March. We're, we're planning a workshop next month, your next workshop, uh, to talk about that. But anyways, just wanted to kind of plant that seed and let you know that uh, we heard that as kind of a repetitive theme, and we're really going to run with that right now and, and see where that takes us. So I'm going to pass the baton now to Brian. Uh, he's going to talk about a couple. Thank you, Caleb. Um, so as part of the comprehensive plan, uh, we have more work than the steering committee can do. There's a lot of material to review, a lot of things to absorb. Uh, so we focused, or we created four focus groups. Uh, three initially were the transportation, housing, and economic development. Uh, the fourth one was community design and character. Each one of these is met three to four times. Um, their principal primary responsibility was to review uh, the adopted policies that we have now, uh, sift through those, tell us what's good, what's not good, uh, what sh should be thrown away, or what we should be adding. Uh, hopefully we'll be reducing some of the numbers we have now. Um, the community design focus group has one more mini, but otherwise those are, those are wrapping up. Those have been really informative, I think. The consultants have gotten a lot of feedback and direction on some of the changes they should make for a first blush kind of review of what those policies should look like moving forward. And uh, we're starting to just get those now, so I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the output of that and seeing what the community thinks about it. Something else uh, I'd like to overview with you briefly. Uh, as part of this plan, we have uh, four specific area map changes or map discussion areas we're looking at, four map changes. Uh, the first is the fields area in the top left. We have the Magic View, Woodbridge, Locust View area in the top right, uh, the Southern Rim area in the bottom left, and then Southwest Meridian in the lower right. Obviously, those are not geographically oriented properly. Um, so, Caleb, if you can open up a browser. Part of the comprehensive plan um, outreach, we have an online website where we're asking the public to get engaged with some concepts for these maps uh, areas. Uh, so each one of these concepts has two or three uh, variations uh, from what is currently adopted, and we're asking the public what they think about that. These concepts are, and if you get any questions, these concepts are just discussion points. So there were a diverse range of opportunities that the consultants first created and then the steering committee reviewed and commented on. And we're really just asking the neighbors, stakeholders, property owners, how they feel about them and what they'd like to see. Uh, so if you, if you go to the comprehensive plan website and uh, go to the specific area analysis section of that, there'll be a few options to click on uh, those concept review studies. So you can see they're basically all the orange links. So engage online, concept review and study. There's another one further left. Those will all take you to a interactive kind of survey. Yeah, just click on that one. So when you first get here, you'll see those four areas. On the left, you'll see a summary with a review of some high level land uses that are kind of opportunities. Uh, these are not always our exact land uses. They're generalized. For example, we have mixed-use residential and mixed-use uh, non-residential. We actually have a lot more than that. The, uh, after you go through this, the first tab after that is zoning. It shows you our adopted uh, existing zoning. You can zoom around and explore there. After that, uh, number two is the adopted future land use. Again, you can zoom around and explore on that. And then three, four, five, and six are all uh, concepts. So if you click on that, sure, that one's fine. Um, on the left, you'll see an overview of the concept with some description. And then if you continue scrolling, you'll see a few more concepts. And then if you keep going at the bottom, you'll have a, a survey. So you can say which one you, you relate to or like the most, and then what sort of changes or revisions or improvements you'd like to see on these. Our consultants are going to take all this feedback and, and recommend some actual changes to the steering committee. The steering committee will then review that and, uh, and make some uh, pro pro proposals for what will move forward with an application to PNZ and City Council later this year. Any questions on that? Quick question. 
the information that's in there, is that something that's been uh, disseminated out on things like Nextdoor and Facebook? I'm, I don't remember seeing it, but. I Good question. Uh, yes, that has been advertised all over. Uh, the specific areas, um, so general, generally on the website, uh, that information is sent out. Uh, Casey Emery in the mayor's office has also been doing an awesome job uh, outreaching to those areas specifically, asking for input um, several times. And we also have had several public workshops. So we had uh, one on last Monday and last Tuesday. The first one was for the fields area. The second one was for the Magic View uh, Woodbridge area. Uh, the first one in the fields was held at um, Willow Creek Elementary School. That was very well attended for the number of property owners out there. What did we have, 50, 60? It was, it was very well attended for the area. Uh, the second one on Tuesday night for the Woodbridge area, uh, we didn't get as many Woodbridge people as we had hoped for, but we had a huge crowd uh, from the other areas. Uh, actually, we filled conference room A, B up, or meeting room A, B up, uh, probably at least 100 people in there. Um, we're also, at a stakeholder request, going to be having a third one for the two areas in South Meridian uh, at the Southern Rim Coalition's request at uh, Hillsdale Elementary School next week. So we'll be doing that one as well. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of online outreach. We've also had the, the, the ones physically. So does that answer the question? Yeah, I think you're... Um, sorry. Sorry. sorry, Dean. I, I'm used to a different microphone. Um, I, I think you're pretty pleased with the overall um, participation in general, both um, in person, online, and, and through the various surveys. So I, I know that the public outreach and trying to engage our citizens have been good, and so has been the return. So I appreciate all the efforts of of your office and, and the consultant in working with our public and trying to hear the diverse group of um, opinions out there. Any other questions at this point? Madam Mayor. Mr. Kavner. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Brian, uh, of the four specific maps that are in front of us, is there one that the survey responses kind of have exceeded above all others or are responses all about the same for all four? <laughs> I, so I... I Councilman Kavanagh, I'm not sure. Uh, we, I haven't looked at the survey responses yet. Uh, we've had some paper ones as well, so they're not all online. When I asked a couple days ago, we hadn't had very many yet, um, but that's turned around in the last few days, I'm told. Any other questions? Okay. So we do have two other areas we're looking at, and these are kind of questions for you. The first one on the right or on the left is the uh, wastewater resource recovery facility. I always want to call it the treatment plant. Um, the brown area you see around that is a mixed use non-residential land use. The property owners around that are not very happy about the non-residential land use. They want to sell to developers who are interested in doing subdivisions. However, that land use is in place because uh, Public Works, when that facility began a few years ago, um, well, when they did a study for the facility a few years ago, basically said that the nuisances from that were not good and not well for adjacent neighbors. Uh, there's, there's trucks, there's heavy equipment, there's the, the obviously the most important one is, is the smell. Um, and they continue to make, ex they continue to expand out there and, and do work. Um, we had some property owners request uh, a meeting and ask us to do some land use changes. When we began this process, council asked us to, to take requests seriously and if, if they were feasible to carry them along through this plan. Uh, when we met with them, we asked them to give us a written uh, letter asking what they would like uh, and then a justification as well. We have not received that. So while they're very unhappy with the land use, we've not had any follow up with them yet. Uh, there's also been a, a developer representing them that is not, not intending to buy the land necessarily, but just kind of, hey, this isn't necessarily the best thing for them. Would you consider changing it? We heard him out. Um, but I guess the short is we're not really sure what to do with it. Public Works is not ready to let go of the mixed use non-residential around that. As I said, they're still making active improvements out there. Uh, they haven't done all of their noise, sound, and odor mitigation yet. Uh, and they're worried that if we change that, they could be dealing with a lot more complaints. 
Um, the question for city council, hopefully, and if you can, any feedback would be appreciated, uh, is, is whether we should move forward with the change out there or put it on hold for the time being. Anything to add, Caleb? Brian, have they had any um, outreach to other cities and what is a, an, a, an appropriate transition zone? Madam Mayor, I will try to answer that, but I'm probably not the best person. So Public Works did a study which told them what they should do, and part of that resulted in the mixed-use non-residential. Uh, recently, Public Works has hired a, or in, involved, I don't know if they've hired a, a land broker to look at potential some land acquisition for them. Uh, they need a second point of access in there. Uh, he has done some research and indicated to us that other cities have been able to uh, make these two systems mesh better. Uh, I can say that some of the examples I'm aware of have a more of a, a, a green treatment uh, effect. They have, for example, more um, open space, grass, uh, wetland mitigation features available to you, whereas our treatment facility is all uh, gray concrete hard infrastructure. Uh, I, I'm not sure how many personally have, have had an interface with an infrastructure facility like this versus one that's more of a natural kind of looking. Is that more the um, injected uh, uh, approach than what we have? Uh, I'm aware of, so in college I actually did some st a study on wastewater treatment facilities and, and, and using green, green tech to basically treat this sort of stuff. Um, we don't do any of that. So the stuff that's a nice interface where you can kind of, the, the smell's okay because you have something pretty to look at. We don't, we don't have any of that. So um, while we do use uh, uh, organic uh, uh, germs uh, to, to eat some of that material and dissolve it, um, it, it's still in a big concrete pond that's open. There's no, yeah, there's nothing else going on. Uh -huh. uh, Public Works did tell us that they are interested in uh, covering some of the new facilities, so putting it indoors where they can better uh, mitigate for some of that smell. Um, but they're not there yet, and it doesn't sound like they're gonna be there for a little while yet. Um, any feedback from the commission? Mr. Fitzgerald. Madam Mayor, is there, Brian, and maybe the city council knows this, is there a desire or in regards to how are we going to grow that facility? Is there a need to expand as the city grows instead of picking another location? I mean, is that where are we capacity wise and where's the future land growth necessary to continue using that facility for the long term? So I'm not sure what the capacities are right now. I know we're going through active expansions. I know that is our final location. Uh, we're not going to remove that or remove it or move it, uh, though maybe someday there'd be secondary systems. Um, and, but I don't know to what extent they're going to expand, and I don't know to what extent beyond the additional access they, they need property out there. Sorry, I'm not more helpful on that one. Okay. Any other questions? Mayor? Yes, Mr. Sill. Is there any, I mean, has um, something been looked into as far as, you know, a possible opportunity for the landowners to come up with something on their own to, you know, help persuade, you know, us essentially that there's, there's uh, something that can be interworked between them and public works as far as laying things out for that, the, you know, making things more, you know, prettier out there or a better um, landscape for, for uh, people that would eventually be living in subdivisions out there. When we talked to them, some of the things that we suggested for consideration were, for example, uh, some sort of joint or them dedicating some open, their required open space closer to the facility to help mitigate for some of that. Um, but as I said, we've not heard anything back from them. They've never submitted any sort, any formal request or any formal justification for how they would r work around some of our concerns. Thank you. Has the primary communication been with neighbors or has there been any other interest by developers or other parties that have come and expressed interest or had questions about that area? Was it primarily just the owners of those pieces and the neighboring properties? So, Madam Mayor, uh, 
Madam Mayor, members of, of the Commission and Council. Um, so I have not personally talked to any developers, but that was some of what the property owners told us, was they get approached by residential developers that want to develop th their land for residential, and then they look at this and they go, never mind. So, yeah. Madam Mayor. Mr. Kavanagh. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just because Brian's asking for, for feedback, I'm, I'm happy to share some. And I'm, I'm not one who's supportive of making a change um, at this time um, for a wide variety of reasons. Even, I think, attempts to, you know, kind of surround treatment center with open space. Inevitably, probably nobody that's on this commission, nobody that's on the council right now would have to deal with what I would foresee would be significant citizen complaints about noise or smells in some form or another, despite all the great work of our public works department in the future. And I just, I have flashbacks to some of the challenges the city of Nampa had when they started having a residential surround the Sorrento Cheese Factory. And that cheese factory had been there forever and growth caught up to it and the city acquiesced. And then they are running backwards trying to solve significant problems from sound and smell that Quite frankly, those sounds and smells were worse before the people moved in and the, the cheese factory did a great job to try and mitigate that, but it still was impacting the quality of life of those residents who moved there knowing they were moving next to a cheese factory. So I think that uh, we stay in charge of our own destiny and better serve our future citizens by keeping this area listed as is. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the second area on the, is, were there any other comments? Sorry. Madam Mayor of the City Council. I saw a lot of heads nodding. Okay. <laughs> the second area for discussion uh, should be familiar. A couple years ago, we approached City Council about some work out here because we've heard a lot of development requests uh, within the Jewel and Rolling Hill subdivision. That's the low density residential light green area on the right. Um, the area to the northwest at the time hadn't seen any groundbreaking yet. Uh, about half the people out there chose not to participate in any manner. Another quarter told us to go away, and the remaining quarter were interested, but most of them not quite yet, so they kind of asked us to come back. We told them um, the area was kind of a, it really needed to be an all or nothing. It didn't have to be all sell at once, but we needed to be able to plan for the whole area to address transportation concerns and the floodplain and, and the existing uh, rural county roads out there. Um, since then, we've obviously seen a lot of work out there. Silverstone Road has been expanded, Norco's expanded, we have several hotels that are planning to go out there, and we've seen the ICCU uh, application. Some of them can't tell us there's nothing that's gonna happen there, there now. Farmstead is obviously going away. They've said they're going away, and the, 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 the lifestyle in that area is going to change. We talked to the steering committee a little bit about this area, told them the previous work, uh, and they, they thought we should uh, continue some outreach to these areas and see what they think. Staff agrees with that. However, the timing for this right now is, is, is challenging. Uh, this would require a lot of work because we'd have to master plan the whole area. We probably need a consultant to help us. Um, and getting the comp plan uh, approved this year on time is, is more of a priority. Uh, we'd like to get some feedback from you on whether you feel this is a priority as part of the comp plan. When we talked to you last time, we, we kind of let them know that we would take the LDR, the low density residential that's adopted out there now and preserve it because we don't necessarily want to see apartments in the middle of a bunch of rural farms on rural roads. We have a few options. One is to, to leave it alone. The second one would be to go ahead and try to rush some changes in this area as part of the comprehensive plan. And the third would be more of a put it off a few years sort of approach. Uh, if we did that, we'd be looking to, for, to council to really, and PZ to really support that process and delay any more fragmented or, or piecemeal applications and for annexation in this area. I don't know if I need to go into any more history there, but we'd love some feedback and I'd be happy to answer any questions on that one as well. Thank you, Brian. Any comments, questions? Ms. Ma Laura Roberts. Madam Mayor, um, 
I would like to see us kind of take a wait and see approach. Um, I drive Overland on a regular basis and seeing so much happen. I think that that, that area that's shaded in the green will have an opportunity here to kind of change naturally on its own. And then I think we could look at how it needs to fit in at that point. But right now it feels like if we try to tackle it, it's too much, maybe a little too soon and trying to fit a square peg in a round hole particularly. So I would recommend we wait, but that's just my thoughts. Madam Mayor. Mr. Kavner. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Brian, when you talk about staff's concerns about, they use the term piecemeal approval, can sure. you maybe walk us through a little bit more about what you're referring to and where your concerns are? Madam Mayor, uh, Council Kavner. So the area is obviously on Overland Road. That's currently a five-lane facility. Uh, long range, it's planned to be a seven-lane facility. Um, the properties you see immediately fronting Overland all take access immediately from Overland. So you have a, a, a traffic impact and a tr safety concern right, out, right off the bat. If you intensify any of those uses, you increase the opportunity for uh, unfortunate things to occur. Right behind those properties, you have, uh, I believe it's Five Mile, uh, which is uh, existing floodway and floodplain, uh, basically cutting off the rest of the subdivisions behind those f properties. Uh, so to make sure that we preserved uh, connectivity for any improvements in this area, we really need to look at transportation as, as an area, as a group together, and not allow it to occur fragmented. Some of the problems with the transportation network out there now uh, is that they're all rural unapproved roads. They have undersized culverts, there's no sidewalk, there's no curb and gutter. Um, the properties are, I don't mean this, they are hodgepodge, they're eclectic, there's a, a lot of variety of them out there. Some of them are, are small kind of ranchettes, others are um, nicer single family homes. Um, allowing development to occur anywhere in there adversely affects everyone on the rural road with a rural lifestyle and unimproved county roads. Uh, does, does that help? Yes, I, I think in essence, instead of them coming in one lot at a time, that um, it would, I, I think we did that over in, in that area just south of Eustick and, and west of Eagle, that county sub that kind of wrapped from Eustick over to Eagle and said we would kind of like a long-term plan instead of what we did. Uh, whoever wants to annex and hook up to our service will annex you and the others, you can come in as you want to. That wasn't a great re approach, um, we would like to, to see it um, develop kind of like in the portico area where you almost get one application. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilman, I'd also maybe just say that, you know, people want to know what to expect. And if we allow kind of a, things to occur, or one-offs out there, then, then, then there's no plan and we don't really know what to expect. I, I think you have it driven by them when they're ready to, to come in as a, as a whole and say we're all ready, you kind of put the onus on them. And, and Madam Mayor, that, that is one of the options, I guess I would just follow that up with, and we'll, we'll ask them again in another couple of years or so, hey, are you ready to come together? Because we would like to assist you if you are, mm -hmm. and help them. Mm -hmm. kind of organize as a as a community and help them master plan it so I think that's an excellent approach any any other thoughts I agree okay thank you all right so the map is is something that you know and the designations are something we spend a, quite a bit of time on and people want to talk about um, the other part though is the text and the policies and and the, the plan itself uh, in words so I just wanted to quickly kind of flash this, this slide, and it's a work in progress, but it really does follow the whole process from beginning to end in that we, the values and then the vision, so what you see in the blue box on the right are those, those vision themes that, that were pulled out from talking to the community, and we're going to roll that right into the plan. So the framework of the plan will have our five themes and then the 17 to 20 state-required elements that need to be addressed 
are all housed within one of those themes. Um, so this is the, the framework of the plan itself. So we'll explain each one of them, uh, what the vision for housing is, but then you'll have kind of the, the traditional table that you have now in the comp plan that staff will uh, cite in the staff report saying, you know, it, it connect uh, residential subdivisions together through pedestrian accesses. And those types of policy statements um, will be in there, but you'll have um, uh, the, the background information before each one of those elements as well. Uh, the other thing and why it's so bold on the screen, we, we really are trying to make it um, more usable online. Most people are on their handheld device, uh, in front of a PC, whatever. Um, and so we really are trying to make this so you can navigate through the comp plan electronically. As, possible. Uh, realizing our resources aren't that of a big city to make it all the bells and whistles and pretty things moving and flashing at you and stuff, but we do want to make it so it's it's usable and fairly straightforward online and you can find what you're looking for within a click or two. So um, just wanted to flash that more to come. The steering committee, is that this is going to get vetted more through the steering committee, but that's kind of uh, overall kind of what we envision for uh, the plan. So this is a draft, but kind of hopefully gives you an idea of what the plan itself will look like. Okay, so the next step steps. Um, right now, staff and Brian kind of touched on this a little bit. Staff and the consultants are listening to the public. Um, I don't know if you caught it there, but but those um, specific area outreach opportunities at the end of the month, we may extend that a little bit further, but we're trying to kind of wrap that up here end of next week or so. Um, but that we're going to then kind of gather that information, tweak some of those concepts to get to a preferred concept, and then roll that into a bigger uh, future land use map. But we're still in the process of listening to the public about uh, their preferred choices and what opportunities exist out there, um, and have those then be reflected in policies and on the future land use map. Then we're going to take that to the steering committee. So March 8th, I think, is when it was promised to uh, the first two chapters. So what you see there is the introductory uh, uh, chapter and the livable theme or livable community uh, chapter to the steering committee. They essentially have a couple of weeks to review that, get their comments in to the consultants, and then we freeze it. And then we give them another couple of chapters to review, give them two more weeks, freeze that, so on and so forth through May. So every month you get two more chapters. And then in June, we'll throw back the, f the whole thing and then you get the steering committee will get one more. Hey, is, did we hear you right? Is this really what we want to go out to the public with? And that'll happen in June. Um, and then July and August, um, all through the summer, Brian and I are doing Roadshow Part 2. Second year, we'll be at you know, uh, Broadway for concerts, at the movies, uh, coffee with the mayor, whatever's going on. We're, we're going to try to make ourselves present and get that public review of the draft document. Take those comments in, do some final tweaking of that, and then submit the application for the official public hearings before the Planning and Zoning Commission in October, City Council in November, uh, with an effective date shortly thereafter. So that's kind of the plan, not a lot of wiggle room. Our goal was to get it done by the end of this calendar year. Um, that leaves us a little bit, you see there on the end, but not a whole lot. So uh, that's, that's kind of the plan and next steps um, for, the, for the project. So uh, thank you for, again, for your time listening to us on this topic today. And with that, uh, stand for any questions, comments, um, yeah, whatever else, so thank you. Thank you, Caleb. Ms. Perel? Madam Mayor, uh, the mayor had mentioned that generally the city is happy with the responses they receive from the public. What was the expected participation and have we exceeded that or met it? So I'll start from, from my perspective. Um, we didn't have, I mean, we'd like to reach 100%, um, but that's not going to be, be possible. Okay, we realistic. Did, yeah, realistic. Yeah. Uh, but, we, but we did get some early... Uh, results from some of the initial outreach we did. Um, the, and it's tough, right? They were grouped like zero to five. We, you know, are many four and five year olds. But the, up to 18, we were, we were a little disappointed in the percentage of the youth that we were, this is their plan. So we're really hoping to engage more with them. And we've done some things through MIAC and trying to really get to some of their events and have them engaged a uh, member on our steering committee and, and really trying to hear the youth voice more. Um, but as, as an overall number, I don't think we ever really set a target of, you know, 110,000 people, we got to hit 90,000. Um, but it really was getting a broad, you know, getting to the, the different folks in different parts of our community that are different age ranges and different industry representatives and, and just keep 
and wide in in uh, public outreach, but Brian can correct me, but I don't know that we ever said, you know, 25% of the population or anything like that. Yeah, we, we never set, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, we never set a, a, a target per se. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've reached a few thousand people though. Is that, I can't remember. We have a slide in the in the presentation we did before this, and I know Mayor and Council have seen it, so I pulled it out. But I can I can pull it up if there's other questions, and then I'll I'll put it on the screen real quick, and you can see the outreach to date um, that we've had. Okay. Hey, any other questions? Why we're trying to find that, Madam Mayor? Yes, Mr. Fitzgerald. And Caleb and Brian, I, I know the. Mayor and this, the council worked diligently to push for transportation corridors down the legislature, especially with Highway 16 additional overpasses. Is that all, as much as you can, telegraphed in this comp plan? Or how can you kind of give me an understanding of that? Um, Mayor, Commissioner, I, I don't know, telegraphed, we, we definitely will have, so put one of the things, and, and I can go back to the, to the slide, but the transportation, it's pretty, um, it's in connected, so it's one of the latter ones we're actually gonna review because there's a lot there. Yeah. Um, and we haven't fully got that, uh, the data and the information back, but I do anticipate, certainly we'll have key corridors that are talked about, State Highway 16, uh, Linda Road Overpass, some connections in downtown, we'll have some policies, that are baked into the plan and, and we talk about, um, you know, it's, it's a good, you know, the comp plan is a guide and, and it, it's aspirational. Um, so we definitely will have some things on, on that as does the current comprehensive plan, but we haven't gotten there with any policies or even the background information at this point. Madam Mayor, Commissioner, I, I can say with State Highway 16 specifically, that for example has been on our maps for years now. So it's, it's always been something that we've been looking at and considering. I actually know where it is. So we, <laughs> I'm we, yes, we have the alignment for that. <laughs> I'm joking. It's okay. Thank you. No, we're just guessing. <laughs> I think I, ITD keeps moving it on you, Madam Mayor. I, I did want to um, at least note, since Linder Overpass was mentioned at our joint meeting with Ada County Highway District today, uh, the council and um, commission talked about if we could escalate the priority of the completion or at least the construction of that. And ACHD is very receptive to um, standing side by side and going to Idaho Transportation Department and requesting that that be elevated in its priority. So there are some next steps, but I think it was a very positive outcome and message from Ada County Highway District that they indeed have an interest in um, seeing if we can move that up. Just maybe to circle back on uh, President Pro's uh, question, we. This is a little bit outdated and this, it, that phase three again, that, that data is still coming in, so this doesn't represent the opportunities and choices phase, but through the first two phases, this is, this is the, the reach that we had. So. Thank you. Okay, anything further on this one? If not, we will move to our next item, item number four, area of city impact update. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm gonna tackle this one too. I just have one slide here. Um, this is something that I've been talking about and with the, the city of CUNA and their leadership for at least 10 years about. Um, we just recently have had some conversations that uh, were a little more productive than in the past. And um, I guess what we would kind of informally submit to you is a potential revision to our area of city impact with the city of CUNA. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of that history over the past 15 years or so, um, but just for those of you that may not be aware, 
Um, the city of CUNA did construct a wastewater treatment plant just south of the area of city impact line on 10 mile road, um, right on the Mason Creek drainage. And they've, they've in the years that followed, have annexed um, quite a few properties north of Lake Hazel that are within our planning area, our area of city impact, uh, which makes it difficult for our sewer or water or other services to get to. So we've been trying to negotiate through different ways to um, respect those planning boundaries um, and, and negotiate with them. And again, finally, um, at least this hasn't been vetted through. This is the first time it's really seen the light of day, but at the staff level anyways, this has been vetted through and both staffs agree. Um, the city of CUNA actually considered this two weeks ago, two weeks ago, last week even? Yeah, two weeks ago, Lisa confirms. Um, and they're, they're on board with this proposal. Um, the other thing that kind of would go hand in hand with this would be um, you know, an, an informal handshake type of an agreement that says, okay, we're going to respect these boundaries. <coughs> I envision something like what we have uh, with the city of Boise. There is an occasion from time to time where a property makes sense to develop in one city versus the other, and if, if it's consensual, okay, uh, we relinquish it to CUNA or vice versa. Um, but that would, that's something that, that, again, you go to that the other uh, the city and ask them if it would be okay to serve, and they submit something saying, yep, we, we you know, have our blessing. Um, so I don't know how I could go further with this whole story, but I just want to get these, this map in front of you, get some initial uh, response, and I will also just mention, um, we do have a couple of the concepts. We didn't go to this one in the concept, but it's kind of already out there uh, in some of the concepts in Southwest Meridian. We're, we're kind of already starting to scale back some of our land use designations in favor of CUNAs in some of these areas. So, um, yeah, maybe this isn't the first time it's really seen the light of day because some of those concepts kind of reflect this uh, potential change to our city impact. So, uh, hopefully that's enough, but uh, I can, again, go into more details if you'd like, but this is kind of what's on the table at this point. Hey, Liv, I, I would just... Um congratulate you to be able to say what you just did um, after years of discussions thinking we had an agreement then learning within weeks that um, they had changed their mind again so this is um, we appreciate uh, your um, Warren uh, Cameron's efforts at at finding a conclusion to the ongoing dialogue. Thank you, Madam Mayor, I, I think Commissioner Holland, though, is really probably, she's the one, you know, that uh, that probably made it happen. No, I don't know. But no, she's a... Uh, well, then can I give you the map <laughs> when you really want it? <laughs> <laughs> I, we, we just have been concerned about having a city between our two cities. Um, it doesn't serve either of our communities well, and... It makes uh, very expensive um, services out in the middle of no man's land. But we appreciate any help that you have had on your end in finding a, a resolution. Madam Mayor, um, I, I come from a regional background. And so understanding how communities come together is a really important thing. And we tried to look at it objectively and gathered all of us in a room to really look at um, where the geography goes and where it makes the most sense to service, and that's kind of how the lines came forward. Um, I think Caleb did a great job kind of overviewing what the process looked like, but yeah, thanks. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Yes, Ms. McCarvel. Just thank you, Caleb <laughs> and Commissioner Holland. <laughs> yeah, we thank you for no straight lines for the most part. Madam Mayor. Ms. Pearl. Caleb, could you uh, share with us what the process would be for approval on something like this? How, how is that different from our normal public process? So uh, unless I hear otherwise, the, the, the process will be, we do, we do negotiate with Ada County. They are the, the masters of um, the area of city impact boundaries. Um, really the only thing they can't do is have approve overlapping areas of impact. So what we've talked with CUNA about is jointly approaching the, the county at the end of this year, or as we adopt this plan, 
CUNA is kind of in the, they're a couple months maybe ahead of us in their process to update their comp plan, but a joint application to Ada County to amend Title IX, that's their implementing ordinance of, of the cities in Ada County's comprehensive plans. So it'll be done as we ask them to recognize this entire new document. We're gonna say, and this, including this change and the other changes to the map that are kind of sprinkled throughout. Um, we don't do that all that often, um, but it is a renegotiation with the county. And t historically, if both cities agree, they're a rubber stamp. Uh, there have been some histories where the cities don't agree and it becomes a, a mess, but um, yeah, that's, that's gonna be the process. Probably after, just after the first of the year, we'll, or maybe late this year, we'll submit that joint application and, uh, and make this official with, with Ada County. Subject to public hearings, obviously, here through our process. So. Thanks again. This is a, is a nice place to be at, finally. Okay, if there's no further discussion there, we'll move to item number five under opportunity zones. Madam Mayor, uh, members of the council and commission, it's a pleasure to be with you. Cameron Ariel, uh, community development director here. And looking forward to talking with you about an, uh, a really exciting uh, opportunity, literally, for our community. Um, this is the opportunity zone, as you can see it here on the map, for uh, Meridian. This is uh, a designation that was granted uh, via the, the jobs, uh, Tax and Jobs Reform Act um, uh, of 2018 that uh, basically designates this uh, area of our, of our city as an opportunity zone. And essentially, in a, in a nutshell, um, this it's a, it's part of the tax code. So any any uh, capital gain investment that is um, placed into this zone um, gets a deferral of that tax uh, temporarily up front. If it's held for five years, uh, it's a 10% reduction in capital gains. If it's held for seven years, it's a 15% deferral, um, and if it's held uh, for a total of 10 years, you get the 15% the and it's kind of a kicker, uh, you get um, essentially the, uh, the gains that were uh, had on the investment are not subject to gains taxes. So it's, a, it's quite a, a phenomenal um, a tool that uh, the federal government has put out. Really, that's that's the that's the strings, if you will. Uh, it's very different from most, you know, incentive federal incentive type programs where there's, you know, um, a demographic requirement, a you know, a qualification element, uh, those types of things. It's just if you have gains and you invest them in this area, you are uh, eligible via your taxes to, uh, for for this uh, incentive. So that's kind of just an overview on how the, the program works. Um, again, here's just a, a quick visual for you all to kind of uh, look at that and how that, how that plays. Um, what, and then if, this is just a quick visual on actually how, in, in dollars and cents, how that works. So you can see there, after five years, you get the 10%, the, the after seven, 15%, and then after 10, you get the 15 plus, um, the permanent exclusion. So there's the, it's just a, a great way for uh, folks that are in that situation, whether it's an individual, a corporation, or what have you, uh, to invest in our community. So with that, uh, just real quickly, what we're, what we're hoping to um, really do with this. Um, I'm trying to not be too um, grandiose or dramatic, but it, it, this is truly a, an incredible opportunity for Meridian. Uh, we were just with uh, representatives from the Wood River Valley, Ketchum and Haley and Bellevue areas. And um, they were just, they would kill for this. Um, they want to know more about it so they can come and invest in it. Um, <laughs> and but this is just a sampling of, of some of the calls that we're already receiving in this regard um, and really the way that I look at this is it's um, it truly is a zero-sum game um, our community has this area designation um, others don't so that's really good for us but then 
we are competing really with other opportunity zones. And so uh, it's in our interest to do all we can to market this, uh, to be, you know, up, you know communicate uh, both locally and, you know, uh, as far reaching as we can to try to take advantage of it. What this map shows you is just some, uh, some quick visuals on maybe some of the potential areas. So obviously our downtown uh, is in the zone. Um, there's the, you know, what we're calling this industrial corridor along Pine and, and the rail corridor, and then also the, the med, med tech, med ed education corridor, um, which Caleb uh, and Brian talked about in, in their presentation on the comp plan. Uh, some of the things that, that are happening there with that Woodbridge uh, Magic View area. So again, just something r really exciting um, th that, uh, that we have in our toolkit now uh, to attract business, attract investment, and to uh, hopefully really um, uh, kind of bend this uh, to our advantage in this, in this area. And then just lastly, uh, just a quick note, uh, really what, what our plan is is to uh, you have a handout there in front of you that uh, is kind of a marketing piece, um, and then also just a, a more or less a map of the of the zone. But really, we we do want uh, you to be aware of this. Uh, obviously, for your yourselves as individuals, uh, maybe your customers or clients, uh, people, other people in the community that that uh, uh, could take advantage of this, um, and then of course also, you know, other businesses that are looking to grow and expand. Um, and then also abroad, if there's other investors, uh, capital that is, is looking for a home, we want to have it be in Meridian. So uh, that's just a quick overview for you and uh, we'd be happy to answer any other questions that you may have at this time. Thank you, Cameron. Ms. Pearl? When you mention <clears throat> um, competition with other opportunity zones, are you meaning within the Valley or in other states? Can you clarify that? Madam, Madam Mayor, uh, Commissioner. Yes. The uh, great question. So I, th I think it is. Uh, uh, there, there are certainly local dollars. So yeah, we would be com you know, competing with other zones in the state. But you know, when you think about um, our zone in particular, um, here, and I'll, just, I'll toggle back to the, to the visual just to get, make sure that you can see that there. Um, Really what we're talking about is uh, th there's very few, uh, but some, you know, greenfield opportunities, but most of these will be redevelopment, uh, land acquisition, um, you know, uh, accumulation, assimilation of, of properties. So when you're talking about that, you really are talking larger dollar amounts. And just by virtue of that, you may be talking uh, about, uh, you know, uh, kind of your, your mid-tier, higher-tier investor groups. So it, c it could be a national type uh, competition as well. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor. Ms. Lowe Roberts. Madam Mayor, that was one of my questions, so thank you very much. My other one is, is this a permanent designation or is it reevaluated as tax as areas change? Is it fluid or can we count on this for forever? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Great question, uh, Madam Mayor, um, uh, Councilwoman Roberts. Uh, yes, this is a this this does sunset. So, and, and of course, you know, you never know with the federal government. But that being said, we do. It is on the books for at least um, the next ten years, and it's the designation is already ticking as well. So that's that's something where, again, we feel, uh, you know, from from the staff level, that it is a somewhat of a time is of the essence. We, right. we want to get this out there we want it to be understood and communicated well so Great. thank you yeah and the the time has already started on on the clock which is odd because they're still developing the tax code around it yeah. i mean it's crazy but and if you want to fully realize the benefit it's at 10 years so you know, leave it to government to make something so black and white. Yeah, you may only end up with nine, practically speaking. So, Any other questions? Mr. Burnt? How could you tell I wanted to talk? Because um, you were ready to eat the mic. I feel like I want to sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is... This is 
when, 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 when you, we were speaking earlier about time is of the essence, I don't think that that statement could have been any clearer, in my opinion. Um, there are people, organizations that have money, and they're looking to spend that money, and so why not in our backyard? So Mr. Ariel sent out a, an email to the mayor and city council, I read it, and a part of it struck with me, and the, 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 uh, the, the article was called Distressed Cities Find Hope in Federal Opportunity Zones. And by no means do I believe that Meridian is a distressed city, but this is, this is a portion of this. This is awesome. It says, about half of the net increase in business establishments across the country from 2007 to 2016 took place in either D.C. or New York or other large urban cities. A generation ago, the opposite was the case. Job growth in the 1990s was led by rural and suburban count counties, not urban centers. So in the past, jobs have came from these areas. We have opportunity now to attract these, these dollars in order to create jobs, more jobs, bucket loads of jobs. And there's no reason why this shouldn't be happening in our backyard. Did you so. mention jobs? Yes, <laughs> I did. I get excited when we start talking about jobs. So I can't thank you enough, Cameron, for your leadership on this. Um, I hope this just turns out to be something spectacular for our community. Yeah. Madam Mayor. Mr. Fitzgerald. Cameron, thank you for this pre presentation. I think to Commissioner Bur or to Councilman Burns, sorry, my, I have PTSD from when he was on commission with me. <laughs> no, I'm joking. That's understandable. <laughs> well, we're feeling your I'm pain. I'm joking. <laughs> I think he's too good to my, one of my good friends. No. <laughs> Uh, we had an opportunity, um, I sit on the, the Boise Chamber's Financial Services Committee, and a company out of California and Utah came and presented to this same conversation to us, and it centered around Boise. And the challenge I think they have is almost every one of their opportunity zones is in a, is in a brownfield. It's tank farms, it's previous sites that are going to have some significant environmental challenges that come with them. I think as a city, we have a significant opportunity because of, this, of the area we have to utilize space that's already available, and it wouldn't be that big of a lift to take away some of that funds and shift it to Meridian, um, not having the environmental impacts that they're going to have to deal with in Boise. So I think this is being flo floated out to the financial services community right now and to developers, and I think there's, there's firms moving from California and Utah to come help developers and folks with money to do this. And I think we have a huge opportunity to take advantage of it. So, good luck. I, I keep hearing opportunity. Uh, do you want to go back to that other slide that, that shows, um, yeah, this. So Kevin put this together, and it's such a great visual uh, for the tool that this brings to our community in manufacturing, in the med tech, and in our downtown. Uh, three huge areas that provide um, family wage jobs in an area too, in particular in the industrial <laughs> corridor in downtown, in an area that um, I think there are families that would like this hope. And so it, it's just exciting and it's, um, something that we hope we can adequately communicate what this means to our residents and, and to those investors that, that do have those um, funds that they want to put into an opportunity fund. So exciting. Excellent. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, members of the commission and council. It's a, yeah, it is exciting. So spread it far and wide. Um, if, if anybody has any questions, please refer them our way, and we can try to connect the dots and, and hopefully make a lot of these things happen. Okay. Mr. Olson? Um, one thing to consider on this, uh, these Opportunity Zone funds that are being created, they're a very simple thing to actually create. Yeah. And so it's important to remember that this doesn't necessarily have to be big money. Right. You know, we've yeah. got, there's, there's people that can do this with a million dollars or less. Mm -hmm. 
and so it's a it's a very easy fund. Isn't to a million dollars big money? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm missing something there. <laughs> That's uh, so a good point. It's yeah. uh, you know the the small farms. I'm sorry, the small businesses mm. that are building their facilities and that type of thing. They can take advantage of this. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. We talked about it just today, so <coughs> be awesome. Okay, uh, item number six. I don't know, Mr. Neri, is that yours, Caleb? CJ? Draw the short straw, Mr. Neri. <coughs> I brought that on a thumb drive too, if that would be easier. Okay. Madam Mayor, members of the council, members of the commission, it's my privilege to be here today and talk a little bit about facilitating public meetings and, and that also talk about due process. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Bill Neri, I'm the city attorney. Uh, we staff all of the city council meetings uh, with a member of my office as well as all of your commission meetings. Uh, Andrea Pogue is our lead attorney that handles the um, Planning and Zoning Commission, but occasionally you may see a different one from my office, including myself, depending on staffing. So we, do, we are there for this very reason, is in the land use world, the process and the public meeting process that goes with it is critical. It is the most important part of the land use process is the public hearing and all the information that's just gathered prior to the hearing that becomes part of the record in front of you. So if you hear myself or Andrea or any of the attorneys in, in the meeting trying to corral the meeting to some degree and they think they're sort of trying to be controlling, they're doing it for a reason. And we'll talk a little bit about that. It's only seven slides, so don't worry. I'm a lawyer, so I'll take an hour. We'll be fine. Um, so the due process. He's not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so the due process in land use hearings, as I said, is very critical, and it basically follows state code and city code. And state code is Title 67. That's the um, Local Land Use Planning Act. And then the Meridian City Code, Title 1, Chapter 7, and the two sections deal with one with the conduct of public hearings as well as requests for reconsideration, which are done subsequent to a decision if a person has a concern or an issue with the outcome, they have an opportunity to request it be reviewed and reconsidered, and that is required prior to filing any level of appeal of the land use decision. And then I also included Title 50 because that's the annexation provision. They connected in the Idaho Code between the annexation provision, which is in one title, which is the chapter regarding cities, and they connect it back to Title 67 of local land use. So it's all, it's all interrelated, and so we want to make sure we, again, follow all the state requirements in regards to the hearings and how those are being conducted. So due process is a very, very basic legal concept, and the basic tenets of, legal, of due process is notice and opportunity to be heard. And with land use, one of the requirements, and this is mandatory, is that there is a transcribable record. And we'll get into a little bit more of that in a little bit. But that's the part where you'll probably see myself or Ms. Pogue or somebody else saying, we need to stop right here. We've got to make sure we've we got this on the transcript, make sure the information is being provided properly so that the record is clear. The record is, is what a court ultimately may review in regards to a decision that was made that a person might disagree with. And judges don't watch videos, and judges don't listen to tapes, and judges don't read anything other than what's in the record. So that's why we get very, very concerned that the record has to be very, very <laughs> tight on land use things. Other types of things that might be in front of like the council, you may watch some of our meetings. Sometimes they could be somewhat raucous. And the discussions about different things, whether it's e-scooters, or golf courses or whatever can take a lot of different tracks and that may or may not be significant in regards to the record. But when it comes to land use applications, it's much more tight and, and confined as what needs to be done. So notice is really fairly easy and occasionally there's some hiccups along the way 
And you all have experienced sometimes where we have to re-notice something because the notice wasn't done properly. And in and, and the city, the, we have three notices that are required. The state only requires one, which is unusual in today's time because our state still sort of works off of paper, bulletin boards, things like that. That's how the code is required. So in the state, you're required to publish your notice and, and, your, and in your paper of record. And I have been doing this for 30 years, and not one person has ever said, I read the notice and it was wrong. No one's, no one's ever reads the paper notice that I'm aware of, and if they do, no one's ever mentioned it. But it is required by code, so we do re we require it. The other method of, of publishing that is required is you post your agenda on the bulletin board in your building, which, again, most people don't look at the bulletin board in the building, but it is required. But the two by the city code, and most other cities have similar types of codes like this, require signs and mail notice. And you've had, probably on occasions we've had issues where the sign wasn't posted properly or the mail notice wasn't done properly, and we have to do it over. And so it is critical, and, and it is critical enough that we cannot hold the hearing. So it isn't a situation where the notice is flawed and we can simply hear everybody and then come back again. We actually cannot begin the hearing without the notice being done properly in the first place. Now, we have a standard noticing requirement. We require mail notice to all properties within 300 feet of the site, as well as signs need to be located at points on the property next to arterial roadways where they can be visible and seen. They require, we require they give us a picture and a proof and an affidavit that that's been done. The notice, the mail notice are actually done by the city are paid for by the applicant but are done by the city to make sure the noticing gets done. And there are exceptions occasionally, depending on the type of application, where the notice might have to be 1,000 feet. Or there's a requirement instead that it's done through what they call a PSA or public service announcement because the application is so large that to try to do it to more than 200 properties is very expensive and onerous. So there are other methods the code allows in unique circumstances to allow for different levels of notice. One of the things I've found in our city is we try very, very hard to do as much notice as we reasonably can. So we've taken it upon ourselves in the last couple years or year and a half to do other types of social outreach. So whether it's through Facebook, whether it's through Nextdoor, or some other means that the city might have some outreach, our, our city um, allows you to subscribe to information from the city. We try to make sure we try to get it out there as much as we can. We don't, we, we don't require it in the code, but we try to do it to be transparent and to make sure people are aware. The number one thing that people tend to see is the sign. That is the reality of it. Now, occasionally, it's been my experience that people they might come in front of you and say, well, I saw the sign, but I couldn't read it. Well, it's not meant for you to read it as you drive by. It's not a billboard. So it's meant for you to pay it, notice it and maybe pull over and go look at it so that you know what it is, if that's, if that's the way you want the information. But you will hear that occasionally. I didn't see it, or I didn't get the mailing. Um, again, the requirement is to mail it. It's not necessarily the requirement that we have to have proof you received it, because we don't send it by certified mail, because why? No one will pick it up. <laughs> no one wants to sign for it. It's always bad news, so no one, no one will ever take it if we had to send it that way, so we don't, we don't have to do that. But those are the methods of notice that are required, and again, it is absolutely required before you can even hear it. If it wasn't done properly, we just have to send it over. Mr. Burnt. Mr. Neri. I have, a, I have a question for you. Since we're talking about noticing, I recently met <clears throat> with, a, uh, with a resident of our city and she <clears throat> came up with a fantastic idea about um, maybe noticing uh, neighborhood meetings as well. Mm -hmm. It's just not something we need to get in the weeds in today, uh, this evening, but maybe something to think of going forward about you know, maybe allowing the voice of the people in those geographic areas to know more about, you know, when those meetings are and what's going to be discussed, and so they so they know. I just think that's something that makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the Commission, Councilmember Burt, um, we do require notice of the neighborhood meetings. Really? Yes. So they do are required to give notice to those. So, that, but I think it's just mailed. Is my recollection? Is that right? Yeah, five days notice and it's mailed. So is it 300 feet as well? Or is it yes, six? it's the same 300 foot. So the, but but as we periodically look at the code, I mean, I think the if if the commission or the council 
wants the staff to look at that and what whether that's a reasonable amendment, whether it's to put signs up at that point. Many times that's the purpose of the about. neighborhood meeting. Yeah, that's what he is talking about. Oh, the about. sign. Yeah. Part. Okay. Yeah, and the, the purpose of the neighborhood meeting is to, to say, here's what I want to do, and we hope it's an interactive process and it may change. But, but putting up the sign, you know, there may be some practical reasons that that may or may not work, but that's certainly something, something we can to consider. discuss. Yeah. Follow up. So my only concern is when we when we have ap applicants come and discuss, and you know the developer whoever comes up and they say always we had great discussion with the neighbors. I mean it was fantastic. I mean you know, the, the discussion was great. We spoke about all of X Y Z, and everyone was in agreement. And then you talk to the neighbors, and they're like, uh not so much the case. And so I'm not saying who's right or who's wrong, but in virtually every single application that we have that is of significance, that is the discussion. And so I'm trying to figure out a way in which we can have better communication and maybe posting it like we do, like a normal public hearing, um, maybe something. I, we can't go door to door and force people to come to these meetings by sure. any means, but but we, I feel like by doing that, that, that's doing our due diligence to make sure that, you know, that they are communicating and that, that, the, and that the neighbors know about these meetings. I, I don't disagree, and, and, and certainly we, we can't consider whether some additional methods or some additional way okay. of doing it uh, would be helpful. Perfect. Madam Mayor. Ms. Lil Roberts. Madam Mayor, Bill, um, I attended <laughs> a, a meeting last night that was just, it was put out and kind of billed as a neighborhood meeting, mm -hmm. but because there's not an application currently, it wouldn't actually qualify if they had noticed it five days in advance, it, it wouldn't actually be a neighborhood meeting regarding an application since no application is in place. So, Madam Mayor, members of Council, Council Member Little Roberts, um, wasn't thinking it was going to be stumped the lawyer day. <laughs> so, there are specific <laughs> requirements on neighborhood meetings as to when you hold them and when the application then has to be filed. Because we don't want a neighborhood meeting held today and they file excuse me, six months from now because everybody forgot about it. So there are specifics regarding that. So last it's night's right. neighborhood meeting was just a neighborhood meeting. Uh, and, and it, but it wouldn't necessarily qualify for the neighborhood meeting as required by code. Thank you. But great question. So opportunity to be heard. This is probably the most interesting part of the process for everyone. Um, this could sometimes be the most contentious part of the process for everyone. So let's walk through it for just a second. And again, I know for sure for every one of you, this seems very obvious because you've been doing this. But this is, this is really what the opportunity to be heard is. And I did leave out one because I was focusing on the hearing itself. But written opportunity to be heard is the same in, in the law as testimony in front of you. So there are people occasionally say three minutes isn't long enough. Well, then they can submit it in writing. I mean, that the, the written word is, is just as important and just as considered as the spoken. So just because you have a lot to say, we are trying to maintain a level of order to the meetings and try to control some of the meeting itself. So as we walk through it, staff presentation, that's normally not timed. That is the staff presenting what's been in front of you, where the code is, what the decision has been at planning and zoning, or if it's for the planning and zoning commission, what what decision points you may have, what codes are, re are relevant to the application, what the zone is, whatever, all the information that's provided. Then the applicant has a presentation. It's normally about 15 minutes, but um, it may run into 15 to 20, but it generally is try to keep them fairly confined to a time period. The questions are untimed. We don't count that against the applicant's presentation. We want to make sure, though, again, they have an opportunity to answer the questions and address the issues that may have come up. Individual testimony is three minutes. And again, some folks don't think that's enough time. If there's three people there and the, the commission or the council wants to give them a little bit more time, that's fine. If there's 200 people there, three minutes is a long time uh, with 200 people. So it, it really is something that the chair can control because, again, your meeting is not intended to take nine hours and you want to get some order to what you're doing. But secondarily, one of the things to look at, and that's why I wanted to show this slide, the applicant has a 15 to 20 minute window, and then they have a five to maybe 10 minute window for rebuttal, and the questions are on time, but they have a fairly 
narrowly defined scope in our process to present it. The public testimony has none. 200 people can come and talk for three minutes. So when, when the comment comes back to you of there's not enough time, there's an unlimited amount of time. Each individual has three minutes. So, and, and again, most of you know this, but one of the folks, to, to, if they, why they watch this, the purpose is to present to you. It's not a debate. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of the record is to present to you what what's the person wants to do and for the public to weigh in whether they are pro or con of what's being proposed. But it is to the chair or to the, to the body, and that's why oftentimes you will have to redirect and say, no, the questions go to the to the body, not to the individual. It's not a debate that the person that came up before said the wrong thing or gave a different opinion than you have and you want to argue with them about it. It is meant because that way the record is very clear to the judge. What, are the, what is the body considering in making the decision? And that's why we try to steer away from this debate that sometimes can devolve in these. So after you go through that, again at the end, many of you have heard often that Again, the rebuttal, the, the, the applicant gets the last word, and, and that is clear in case law in Idaho. The applicant has to have, it is their project, it's their property. So they get the last word, but my caution is always is, just because you're gonna give the applicant the last word, it doesn't mean we keep having a dialogue constantly back and forth, we bring one person up, then they come back and they have another, it's not the intent. The intent is to make it clean, and the reason is because once we get to a legal process later, which could happen, judges can't find, and it's very difficult in a record that's very unwieldy. It's like, it's, uh, the best thing I can say is, it's, it, all of the record itself is like a ball, okay? But we'd like it to be the size of a softball, not a basketball. And the bigger and bigger you make it because there's this constant back and forth and you let somebody come up again and they talk a second time and a third time because they have another question and they didn't like what somebody said, it makes it very difficult to be able to show to the judge because the legal standard the judge is looking for is, was the decision based on the information in the record? Did they make a reasonable decision? It wasn't arbitrary. It wasn't simply based on emotion, but it was based on the record of information in front of the body whatever it is. And if it is, but it's at this point, and this point, and this point, and this point, and this point, trying to gather that all back together is very difficult. So we really caution about being concerned, or get concerned when we do that. So we really wanna make sure, so if you see myself, or you see one of our attorneys saying, please don't do that, there's a reason for that. Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Bill, one item that I don't see on here that I'm we're going to get some clarification on is typically we see groups or organizations, homeowner associations be afforded added time or 10 minutes. Is that something that is in the law or is that just a privilege or a courtesy that the chair of the meeting has decided to grant? Great question. I apologize for putting that. Madam Mayor, Councilman Kavner. So yes, th that, is a, that is a privilege and a courtesy. Okay. That is all. Because the intent of that normally is to make sure if this person is going to talk for 50 people, that 49 of them aren't going to come up and talk anyway. That, that's the courtesy. Now, occasionally, there is some logic to that. I mean, occasionally, that person may not have covered all the points. And that one person may have said, well, they've put most of my stuff. So we have tried to be flexible, I think, at both the commission and council level about that. But it really is to try to say, you know, if you're speaking for a large group, we'll give you more time. But it is a courtesy. It's not a right. Whether it's not a right by code or by case law. Great. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Ms. Pearl. Uh, Bill, there's a, a document called Public Involvement for Development that I believe is published on the city website, and it, it delineates what happens at the neighborhood meetings and the mm -hmm. public meetings. Is there any way to add these uh, time frames to this and, and maybe encourage the applicants to be sending this out with the neighborhood letters, uh, or at least let the applicants know that this is available for it to be sent out with the, with the letters for the neighborhood meetings, and then maybe people would choose to write in if they have something more lengthy to say, since they'll be aware that they'll have a three minute limitation. Is there? Good idea. I think that's a great idea. Madam Mayor, Commissioner Pearl, I think that's a, that's a great idea. I can certainly talk with planning and see if we can enhance that. So again, folks do understand. I mean, and again, the limitation is not to suppress people's opinions, but it's to make sure everybody can get their opinion. Yeah. You know, again, if you have an unlimited amount of time, 
sometimes it can get so unwieldy that it gets lost. And so that's a great suggestion. But it is also impossible to say, well, I saw your hand up. You've, you gave your time to not allow them their three minutes. It, Madam Mayor, you're absolutely correct. I, I, I agree with you. And it's difficult to tell people no. Um, and again, may, they may have a different point that may not have been raised. But, but the hope is that most people do have a spokesperson and they are going to just let them speak for them. So as I stated before, transcribable record, email is fine. Email becomes part of the record. What isn't normally part of the record is the video stream. So the fact that we video this and it's available on YouTube, it's not part of the record. Now, I haven't seen that asked. I mean, the, a, a counsel for an, app, an appellant could request that. And we could have a discussion with the judge. I haven't experienced that yet, that somebody has asked for that or there's case law about that. Obviously, many cities don't record and broadcast their meetings, but that's becoming more popular. So since we're still tacking things on a bulletin board and publishing a paper that nobody reads, it'll be a while before that makes it into the Idaho Code. I don't see that being anytime soon. But on that issue, an issue we have seen, and this is not meant to, to, to be a negative to anybody, but one of the things that I've noticed over my time, with these video streams now, people in the audience and people at home can see what you're doing. In the past, when we didn't have a video stream, if you weren't in the room, you couldn't see what anybody was doing. So if it appears you are not listening or paying attention, and I don't have any way to make you look like you are or not, I'm just telling you, we do get inquiries occasionally that it Years, the people weren't listening. Other cities have had requests for any data on that computer that's in front of you. We've had requests for text messages during a meeting. Other cities are experiencing that now. So there are people that watch and pay attention to that. And it may be perfectly innocent. Hey, the meeting's running longer than I thought. Um, boy, there's a lot of people here tonight. It may be absolutely innocent. But people seem to notice that more because, again, if they're not sitting in a room, they could be sitting at home watching it live and see that. So we are seeing that more. So I just want you to be aware that sometimes, again, you could be looking at information right in front of you that you need to be reviewing for this record, and it appears to someone you're not listening. I just want you to be aware that people are paying attention way more than I've ever seen in my experience. Mr. Burnt. And thank you, Madam Mayor. And just to confirm to, to P and those commission members here uh, from PNZ that it doesn't have to be a government issued cell phone. I mean, it could be anything personal as well. Um, yes, yeah, thank you, uh, um, Councilmember Burnt. So what the request that we will get, and, and you probably don't really want to get in the weeds, but if you ever get, we ever ask you for this, this is, if you don't have a city issued device, I, I don't have a right to access it. But if you did city business on it, then it is a public record. So we could get, if we did get a request, and we have had them before for a text message uh, or a personal email that's related to city business, I have to at least come to you and say, do you have any personal email or personal text messages? If so, can you screenshot it and send it to us because we have to provide it. Um, so yeah, it doesn't make any difference that it's not a city computer. So it may not be the one in front of you. It may be your own and someone will ask for it. So it, it is an area of the law that is evolving it's not, obviously, again, we're still tacking things on bulletin boards and printing them in the paper. So the code hasn't caught up to what does that mean or how does that apply. But we're trying to be responsive to those types of requests. So, you know, again, it's not a, it's, it's a cautionary comment and that's it. I just want you to be aware we are getting, we do get those. We are not alone. Other cities around the state get them. We have a lot of discussions with other municipal attorneys about that. So any questions? See, didn't take an hour. Thank you, Mr. Right. Neri. Thank yes. You. Hi, Caleb. So, Madam Mayor, I just want to sort of piggyback a little bit on, on this topic. Yes, everything to what Bill said about the record being the size of a softball instead of a volleyball or basketball or whatever he, he said there. Um, just a couple of maybe finer points on that. It would certainly help staff um, if when you're making a motion, it's clear. So concise is fine and we try to help you out with a little bit get the ball rolling after considering all staff applicant and public testimony do this but we don't know what all you're going to be considering right um, we've had some hearings just over this past year and i'm not going to call out anyone in particular but 
I, a half hour ago, I made a motion. That's the motion that's on the table. No, can you please restate that for us for the record so we, everyone's clear what they're voting on and what conditions are going to be modified and just try to be as clear as possible as you can when you're making changes and, and don't leave the guesswork up to us because then um, similar to people you know, watching it, uh, these meetings on YouTube, they watch the findings and they sometimes they're left guessing. Well, did they act? What did they do on that one topic? I heard this, but I also heard that and wasn't quite sure that wasn't clear in the motion. So again, just the request is if you can, just be as, as clear. You know, this condition, I would like it to read this way, that condition this way, and so on and so forth. Or we heard testimony on both sides. You're the ones that are making the decision off the fence. Well, Caleb, you might be really excited to hear that I have Mr. Coles all prepared to repeat motions. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, all right, well, then that'll be my spiel since that's going to fall on the clerk then to repeat <laughs> That really is news to me. I thought that was said and jest at an earlier meeting. <laughs> if I'm really doing that, then, then I'm going to have Chris come to all my meetings now. <laughs> Jest or threat or what? Maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> and then kind of along similar lines, uh, sometimes, occasionally, staff will make a recommendation and, and the commission or the council doesn't agree with, with staff's recommendation or the council doesn't agree with the commission's recommendation. Um, sometimes there's specific findings that go along with that and they're made one way and if you want to go another way, we need that finding or whatever the opposite is in the staff report. So we try to call those to your attention um, to say, hey, if you're gonna grant that waiver request, we need you to make a specific, like why? Why, are, why is this not a special right or privilege? Or why you think this is the right thing to do? So we try to prod you and we will raise our hand. Please don't take any you know, offense to that. Excuse me, can you clarify this? You're, you're leaving that ditch open because you don't think it's a safety concern, right? You know, but if you can help us with that, um, that really helps that record um, be clear. And then there's no, you know, uh, some party or, or another saying, well, no, that's not how the motion was made. And, and we just are trying to make it so um, there's, we're taking, trying to take the guesswork out of what your, the true intentions are of the body. So when you're making a motion, if you can, if you can maybe write it out, and probably a lot of you do uh, write it out, follow that script, um, and then again, we'll try to just make sure everything's covered and, and interject and clarify, and the clerk will read back those motions. So, Caleb, I, I think what would be helpful too is you um, give a nice detail of what the history and, and um, the comments to each application. And you offer text for messaging. I, I think in one of those that if the motion is going to be contrary to the recommendation from staff to approve, um, to note, can you continue this to, I, I don't know, a time certain, so that new findings can be um, made up. S so it, it does help with the record, um, knowing that you can put in those specifics in the findings. Uh, Madam Mayor. Oh, Mr. Nair. Madam Mayor, if I could add on to that too. I mean, one of the things when we talk with planning, and, and, and again, I think it's just trying to get better at, at some of these. Is, is, is like what Caleb was saying. What, what I don't want to do is have to go to court and say, we just crossed the knot out of each of the sentences and it's okay now. That's not what the intent was. So we want to make sure we have clear, clean findings of what was intended. And there will be occasions, and we've had this happen, where we've come back, we've looked at the video, we've listened to the tape, we've gone back and looked at the transcript and said, I'm not totally sure what was meant. So we want to bring the findings back and say, is this what you meant? Because it really wasn't as clear as we thought it was. And, and those usually happen when it's 1 o'clock in the morning and we've been here for six hours. And so it doesn't happen very often. But there will be occasions, whether it's, whether it's legal staff or planning staff, will say, can we set this over and bring it back to make sure we get what you intended? I know it's, it, it, it's cumbersome for applicants. I know time is money. I, I understand that, especially with planning and zoning only meeting twice in a month. That sometimes can be difficult. But... We definitely want to get it right. We don't want to. We, hey, again, quick isn't better. Uh, it, quick costs money. Madam Mayor, we also make a request uh, 
I really appreciate the summaries that you provide to us as you're, the, as you're reading them in the staff presentation. But sometimes when we're making a motion, I'm finding myself trying to compete with the presentation information and then pull the staff report up so I can get the location of it in the staff report. So if in that summary that you provide to us, if you make a suggestion for, for uh, a change or something that you want the, the applicant to do differently according to uh, the code, that you would reference the location of it in the full staff report. That would be really helpful because then that's when we end up, the motions get broken up when we're looking back through the staff report and trying to find out the exact location of it. But if it's on that summary, it would be a lot quicker. Thank you. Other comments? Madam Mayor, members of the Commission and Council, if you'd like, we can move on to, this is kind of segueing into item number seven here. I know our time's getting short and PNZ's slated to start at 6 p.m. tonight. So I just wanted to take care of a couple housekeeping items this evening um, before we uh, conclude the joint meeting. But I did want to let the Commission and Council know that we did uh, hire our new associate city planner, and it's actually someone that's already on the team. It's uh, Kevin Holmes, who is currently an assistant planner, but today is his first day as the associate city planner. So in the upcoming meetings, you should start seeing Kevin's face at the meetings. Uh, please congratulate him as, you, as time allows. And then I also, yeah, thank you. And then a couple, almost a year ago, uh, we were before you, myself, Caleb, at a similar joint meeting, and we were talking about how can we provide you better information. And as part of that, we came through and updated our staff report and came back with the format, worked with the directors, we shared all the changes with you. And so now we've had that in place for several months and staff really just wants to gauge how you guys like the template, are there things we can do? I know we're ever changing those documents. We found some things that we needed to improve on as well as we started implementing that new document. But I just wanted to get your particular feedback on that and then also let you know that we have made some updates, uh, just some process changes for you uh, to help better inform the community. I think that we heard from you the, tonight that you wanted more involvement on the neighborhood meeting side. That's why I provided you with that handout to let you know we did take that on. We'll take your suggestions, look at that document, see if we can add those changes. But the other thing that we did was with the help of Brian McClure, I've got to give him kudos because he's kind of the IT guru for the department, uh, the jack of all trades, that's what we call him. Um, but he's actually created an active hearing level map on our city's website. And that's an opportunity for the public to go to our website, click on the properties that are surrounding them, and see what, op what projects are currently in the hearing process. That takes them right to Laserfish. They get to see all of the submitted plans, the application, any agency comments. It's a link, quick link right to all of that public information. And I can tell you that's made a tremendous difference um, to the public. So I just. If you weren't aware of that, I just wanted you to make you aware of that because that's really a good resource that I've, I've really, I've found a lot of value in communicating that to. I noted in the state of the city that that is the most common used of the, the maps that we've, we've added. So yeah. it's a great function. I, I, I find, and again, thanks to Kevin and Ryan and Stephanie for some part, they, they're the ones that update that and keep it informed. <laughs> And we found it a good cross-training tool for our assistant planners that may want to grow with our organization. Now they know when they get phone calls from the public, now they know what's coming in through the door and they're participating in that and, and getting a taste of that and learning from the other planners on what's happening with those projects. So it's just been a very universal tool for all, for all of us. So I, I just wanted hats off to the team for stepping up and making that happen for the community. Thanks for pointing that out, yes, Bill. And, you're very and welcome. Great work. And then the last item is uh, I think I shared with you the, the commission a few months ago, but we've also had IT kind of add some shortcuts on your desktops to point you to the cut sheets for our land uses. So that way, when neighbors come up and they're asking you to going through some of those comp plan land use changes, or not changes, but um, design elements, you have all of, those, all of those right at your fingertips so you can pull those up right on your computer and understand why something may or may not be consistent with the comprehensive plan and why staff's recommendation recommendations one way or the other. So again, we've tried to get those tools to you as easy as possible and make it more convenient for you. But those are some of the highlights that I, I wanted to share with you. And then also just any, any, uh, any other changes you want us to 
any code changes you think we should take, uh, partake in, or how can we improve communications to our customers, and then also any feedback that you have on the staff report is also appreciated. Thank you. Any comments from commission or council? Madam Mayor. Ms. Pearl. I just want to say thank you for that you're, um, you've done such a great job with the changes to the staff report. I appreciate the consciousness with which you do it and that you're wanting to help all of us be better at what we do. I just, I'm very impressed at the attitude that the planning department takes towards it and just how much you've listened and, and are interested in, in helping that, um, make that process easier. It's, it has made it easier and I appreciate it a lot. And the one thing I have liked most about the staff report <clears throat> improvements is adding in the exhibits and adding in the maps and the different images into that. That's That's been very helpful. Madam Mayor. Yes. I would echo the same comments. I think the most helpful thing is the four maps that are up at the top, um, especially the planned development map that shows what's coming in um, or what's been approved previously. I think that's really helpful to see kind of what's around it. Um, also like that there's bolded um, items of things we need to pay attention to a little bit more carefully. That's been really helpful as we make notes and we um, get ready for the meeting. So appreciate the work you've done on it. It's great. I almost called you Miss Bloom. <laughs> Madam Mayor. Mr. Fitzgerald. In agreement, I, I think we all grab binders, and I think having the information that we're in the binders up on our yeah. desktop, it, it helps a ton. I have a random question, Madam Mayor, and it may go to Bill's, to Mr. Neri's um, attention. We've had random applications come in as of late where the applicant has coded or uh, talked about federal code about you cannot take an action on this because federal code does not allow it. Andrea did an amazing job in managing it in the middle of the meeting. How do we prepare ourselves for, when someone says by the Telecom Act of 1996, you can't do this because of this. How does the city council or staff want us to handle that? Because I, I don't know if he's telling the truth. I don't know if that's the case. I'm sure because the feds like to do more regulated than they need to, but is there a way that you want us to handle those conversations? Because I, I, that one hit me a little sideways and wasn't sure how to exactly respond to that applicant. Extraordinary. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council and the commission, Commissioner Fitzgerald. I think, I mean, hopefully, almost always, we'll know that ahead of time and we'll be able to answer that question for you right then, if it is applicable or not. That when that normally has come up is in telecommunications and, and it is to say microwaves don't hurt people and they've kind of addressed that. So most of the times that is right and we've already looked at that at the staff level. So, but if you ever have a question or ever have a concern that we need more time or something else to look at, um, we've had people bring up uh, riparian lands and waterways and ducks and geese. And I mean, they bring up lots of those things and sometimes we aren't sure and we may need time. So council and planning staff might say, you know, we need some time to look at that. So. We're going to have to put a pin in that and have them come back. Yeah. So you're not looking to have Andrea know all the federal code? She does already know all the federal code. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Mayor, if I can just quickly put a finer point on a couple of Bill's uh, comments. So you all, we worked with IT over this last month. You all should have this icon that I'm hovering over on your screen right now. It should all be on your screen when you're not watching a presentation. And so I'm not gonna go through all the documents that are there, but if you don't remember what high density residential means, there's a cut sheet that tells you. Um, kind of to, to Bill's point a little bit, I won't necessarily go there, but um, the maps that Brian helped co-develop with, with uh, IT, um, these, these are a little snappier. Um, oh, and unfortunately I'm not logged in here. Um, but you can go there and it loads up pretty quickly with zoning or uh, hearing items and things like that. So this is essentially that same map just on the website. Um, so these are quick links for you that they're help, hopefully helpful. Somebody comes and testifies and says, well, it's R4 for a mile in all directions. You can go here and you can check the zoning and see, you know, fact check a little bit of, of that testimony if you wanted to, uh, to see what's, what's happening there. Sure. The other thing, just back to code, two, two quick things on code. One, um, just earlier this week, or maybe it was late last week, Bill sent out to the UDC steering committee the next round of UDC code changes. 
And so we're getting some feedback from them, but I anticipate here within the next few days or so, that application will be submitted. So to planning and zoning first, probably six weeks or so from now, and then on to city council on that. Some of what you'll see in there is some direction from both of these bodies on, hey, why, why do you do things that way? Can it be done a different way? And we've got some of those changes in here. We take that direction. In fact, there was uh, uh, some conversations recently by council, and we're going to go and, and look, look at some other codes. What you don't have the liberty to do is change the code on the spot for an application, right? So if the code set, the code's pretty black and white. The comp plan, you have some discretion in get some latitude there. The code, it's black and white. If it says you can't do this within this distance, you can't. We can change the code, but that'll take a few months to change the code. If they want to wait and come back, we can bring you back a new project that then complies with that code, but don't have that latitude to just say, we don't like the code, therefore we're not going to apply it to this case when in fact it does apply to that case. So. Um, any questions like that? And again, we usually try to raise our hand and say, well, y y you can't. You know, that's not allowed in that zone. Just because you want it to be doesn't make it so. Um, but, but that feedback's good. If you're like, well, I don't understand why we have this, we'll look into it and, and potentially make that change. So sorry, right. to, right. I right. wanted to just piggyback those couple of things. Too. So I, I know that we only have 10 minutes that we can give the commission to um, have dinner. So can I add one point though, Madam Mayor, before you end, based on what Caleb said. So it's perfectly fine to, if, if there, if whatever's in your record, that's in your packet is fine. That's part of the record. But if you pull up something else and you want to discuss something else that isn't in the record, but maybe it's on these cut sheets or something else or Google it, please don't Google too much. But if, if somehow make sure you bring up, what are you looking at? Because now that can then become part of the record. So just raise the issue. I've looked, you know, I've looked at this other map we have in our in our that isn't in our packet. I want to talk about it. Fine, let's put it up on the screen and talk about it. So make sure we are making her clear because gathering it in the meeting outside of the record is no different than talking about it outside in the grocery store. Okay. Well, thank you all, and and thank you for um, coming spending a couple of hours with us before your evening uh, meeting. We appreciate that. And I would entertain a motion from council to adjourn. So moved. Okay. I'm, do I have a second? I have a motion and a second to adjourn the special meeting between city council and planning and zoning. And all those in favor say aye. 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 All eyes.